thank you for coming to hang out with me. A big howdy, hello, how are you from Southern Maryland. My name is Tiffany and I'm your hostess. You can find me on Rivalry as The Project Bag and on Instagram as The Project Bag 35 and you've stumbled upon The Project Bag Podcast. Uh, we have a Ravelry group. That's where you'll find uh, links to projects that I talk about um, or, you know, anything else related to what I talk about. Um, the link to that is down below in the description box, or you can simply uh, search under the groups tab on Ravelry for the Project Bags community because that's the name of the group. Um, I intend it to be a community, although it's been a little bit quiet, but thank you to the few people that have joined. Um, I haven't been really good about getting the word out there that I even started a podcast. So thank you to those of you who have come over and, you know, taken a, a gander at me. Uh, whether it was from Instagram or if it was because we're friends somewhere else or, you know, just maybe through Vlogmas or, you know, whatever. So just some random search. Um, I do appreciate you taking a bit of time with me today. Uh, I probably won't have as long of an episode as I've put up previously. I uh, just, I've had some crafting time, but just haven't made a lot of progress. I'm not sure... Uh, I definitely couldn't do this every week because there just wouldn't be enough content. But I do have a couple of things, you know, spoiler alert, uh, this guy, he's all finished. So let's start with what I'm wearing. I'm actually, this is crazy. I'm wearing two cardigans. Of course, they're not, um, they're not hand knit, but, uh, you know, two commercial cardigans. Uh, but my hand knit today is this shawlette. Um, this is the By the Sea Shawlette. Actually, the title, the, the name of the pattern is just By the Sea. It's written by Laura Linneman, but it is in the Shawlette category. It's not, you know, it's not very big. Um, maybe I could do with a reblocking of it, but um, it's, you know, it's pretty small. I mean, it, it's small considering that I prefer to wear my shawls as a bandana style. Um, when I wear this one, I do have to usually pin the ends together underneath. Um, but you know, as a, as an around your shoulders, just to give you some warmth, it's perfectly fine. Uh, that's just not the way I typically will wear them. But anyway, this is, uh, by the sea, as I said, it was knit with two colorways from Unwind Yarn Company. Um, the teal is her journey sock base. And the colorway was somewhere. <laughs> We've got all these tabs open. Uh, Until We Meet Again. It was a fundraising colorway during the month of September. Uh, it was sold during the month of September. I believe that's right. It might have been October and September. Um, a few years ago. And it was for ovarian cancer awareness. Um, some of the proceeds from the sales went to ovarian cancer awareness. Um, and then the purple which is striped in and is on the edge is the honeymoon sock base. And it was the Transylvania tramp colorway. Um, honeymoon is a lighter, um, a lighter weight fingering, but the two work really well together. I like this color combination and, um, all told the shawl was 430 yards. I didn't even use, um, I didn't even use a half a skein of this purple. So, uh, so I had some leftovers to go in my blanket, um, and I can't remember if I put it in anything else or not. Um, but this, I knit this in, uh, June, it was June through August of 2016. So that is what I'm wearing as far as knitwear, hand knitwear today. Um, it's gray and cold and I've just turned the heat on but it was 61 in here I was holding out for as long as I could so that's <laughs> hence the double double cardigans uh, probably might end up taking some layers off though because it's going to warm up in here rapidly now that the heat's on so that is what I'm wearing um okay so in pro progress process on my notes here I say process but whatever <laughs> what I'm actively working on. I think last time I showed my niece's socks, this is still the first sock, um, but I worked, I've been working quite a bit this week 
and yesterday I had some downtime for about an hour and I was able to get my uh, get the foot down to I think I've got it down to 50 rounds from the heel flap for the foot as I normally do for her um, she's five in case you're not aware uh, so they are child socks so they won't go you know too far but 50 rounds typically um, but this is a sport weight and I'm knitting it uh, I'm getting I think eight eight or nine stitches to the inch with this so I think I might go maybe another four or five rounds and measure it again to see um, I'm not quite to where I am would be satisfied putting the toe in yet, but I'm very close. So this colorway is Mountain Twilight. It is from Rock and String Creations, and it, this is her um, sport base. I'm not, I can't remember what exactly she calls the sport base. Um, excuse me, Jitterbug Sport, and which is a 80, nope. Yes, it is. It's 80-20 nylon and merino, or merino nylon blend. Um, and then the purple, the solid, that coordinates very nicely, is uh, Knit Picks Hawthorn Fingering Kettle Dye in the colorway Goddess. Um, and so, anyway, that's kind of, uh, I worked on it yesterday, uh, as I said, at work. Um, it's a, you know, just like socks are, it's a really good project to have. Um, you pick up, put down, and not have to think about anything just go round and round and round. So anyway, that's that. I cast these on, I think, um, sometime in November. It was right around Thanksgiving. So, um, or American Thanksgiving, I should say, obviously, since it was in November. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's one thing I'm working on. The other thing that I, I most actively am working on when I have the time um, and the brain space um, I started, this is the sweater for my future daughter-in-law, and I cannot believe I didn't pull up the project page. Let me just do that, silly me. Um, I started it Sunday, today is Wednesday. Uh, no, that's not true. I started it on Saturday, um, and I've, I spent all weekend working on it. Like, it's very potato chippy to me can't have just one row. I want to do multiple rows. I'm almost to the, um, finish the increase where I might, I think next I'll be splitting for the sleeves in about six or seven rounds. So, um, this is the Bloomsbury pullover, Bloomsbury sweater, Bloomsbury pullover. Svetla Svetlana Volkava is the designer and there's an adult version and a child's version of this sweater. Uh, Dana, my best friend, Dana of Unwind, she alerted me to this pattern, uh, I think back in the fall, and uh, it's beautiful. Um, as I said, this is intended for my future daughter-in-law. Her birthday is in March, and um, I'm excited to make this for her. She's totally knitworthy. But it's not the sweater that I had intended to make for her. Um, I think I mentioned last time, <coughs> excuse me, that I had intended to make the Astoria uh, pullover top um, by Kay Hopkins. It looks like this. Um, I'm not sure, you probably can't tell too much detail. But, uh, you know, most of the patterning was on the back and on the sleeves. And then there was a little bit along the hemline. And actually, I think down the, the side of the, um, each side also. I just, there was just too much going on with yoke increases and raglan increases and crossing cables and it, it was, um, this is page one of 14. There was a lot, it was just too much for me to handle. My brain just couldn't wrap itself around what was happening. So I worked on it. Uh, I got I don't know, a little ways in. I did create a project page for it. Um, it's under my frogged category, if you care to see how much I got um, accomplished. But I, after working on it for the equivalent of, I don't know, maybe three or four hours, I decided that I just couldn't do it. Um, there's no way. And I don't want to resent a pattern or, you know, a project that, I ha that I'm making for someone that I care about. So I ripped it out. And I decided to put this one on the needles. I intend to make it for myself. I have some Malabrigo 
I believe it's Rio set aside to make this for myself and um, the pattern is written for worsted. I'm using a DK. I'm using Knit Pick Swish DK. Uh, so I've adapted by going down two needle sizes um, from what the pattern calls for and I'm making the medium. Um, she does prefer a little bit more positive ease than I do so I think it's all going to work out. I tried it on myself a little while ago um, and it's a little bit baggy on me, which means, you know, it'll probably fit her pretty nicely. So anyway, and it's, it's super wash, so it'll stretch out a little bit even more. Um, so anyway, without further ado, all this yakking about it and you haven't even seen it. I put it on my longer, um, my longest cable needle so that pull the yarn out a little bit. Okay. So this is the front right here. Uh, I'm looking over here because I normally got the camera on this side and today I totally put myself opposite. But um, that's the front and it's got a piece of my hair on it. Ugh, it's a long hair business. One of these times you're going to log into here and you're going to find me with short hair and I'll be back. All will be right with the world again. But until then, I'm just going to grumble and gripe about long hair. All right. So Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of stitch markers to keep up with as well. I've decided that when I make this for myself or before I make this for myself, I'm going to take a picture of, uh, or very detailed notes about what each marker means because it's been helpful for me. Um, that is one thing that I did appreciate about the Astoria was there were multiple stitch markers for all the things, but she indicated which colors maybe you should use to indicate, you know, which section of the pattern or whatever. So I did take a page from her book and do that with this. So between these two, Pink markers um, are my increases for the front. And then it's got um, this lace panel down each shoulder all the way carried down the sleeve. And then here is the back. Same thing. Um, the lace repeats all the way down the back as well. So she will need to wear, um, you know, some kind of cami or something underneath of it. But it's a very pretty lace pattern. Um, so, yeah, I'm... I'm tickled with how it's going so far, and hopefully there won't be any snafus. Um, I'm already into the second ball. Um, I bought extra of this yarn. I think I, thinking I was making the Astoria, uh, I thought I was building in an extra two skeins, so um, hopefully I won't run out of yarn. I don't expect that I will, but, you know, fingers crossed. So, that is that. Um... So as far as, those, those, those are my only two active projects, and um, I'm going to try to stay as active as I can with the sweater until it's finished. I, I tend to be, I mean, we've already discussed this about the compartmentalizer thing um, about me, that, you know, I'm working on this box, and this box is where I'm at right now, and so I've got to stay focused. So I do tend to be like a dog with a bone, and once I start working on a project, like, I want to stay focused on it. I don't... I'm okay with having more than one going at a time as far as like the socks because they each serve their purpose, but uh, I do try to stay focused. So what I have finished is the only thing that I have finished is my little gnome here. This is the Here We Gnome Again pattern written by Sarah Shearer. Uh, this is the, I can, since he's finished now, I can check off my very first Bling Your String Crafty Bingo, um, or, well, Bling Your String is the group, yes, but, um, oh my goodness, I've just drawn a blank on Erin's podcast. She must knit. Erin um, is the hostess of that, um, of that podcast, as well as the uh, business owner of Bling Your String. So, she hosts every year Crafty Bingo. And Finish This Gnome was one of my squares. So, since I finished him... Now I can check off one square besides my free space. Um, so this was a Christmas project for a Christmas present. It was intended to be a Christmas present for my aunt for Christmas. And I did not get him finished. So he's now finished for her birthday in April. Um, very fun pattern. It just, I stalled out a little bit. I didn't stall out, but there was just, you know, every round of this hat. Is pattern so 
I could only work on it. It's like the sweater. I could only work on it at certain times. Um, and working on my son's vest became the priority. But like, I think my favorite part of this is the pom-pom. I love a dual color pom-pom. Um, I'm just, I'm really happy with how I think, I don't think if I tap the screen, that's gonna, his nose. This was the first time I made a bubble that I can remember. So anyway, I'm really tickled with how this turned out. It is a, um, I did the worsted weight, uh, or I used worsted weight, um, for this, although I'd say it's probably more of a DK. It's the Knit Picks Mighty Stitch in pomegranate, navy, and I think this was called cream. And then this is a little bit of, um, I think it was Caporetta that I had left over from another project. So uh, anyway, as cute as can be, I sacrificed a Beanie Baby to give me the parts, the Pally pellets that I needed for him. Um, I sure enough decapitated a doggy <laughs> beanie baby <laughs> to get the poly pellets and a little bit of the stuffing. Um, there's only stuffing like in the very top part of his hat and then the rest of him is, is poly pellets. So anyway, you know, 50 cents beanie baby at the thrift store certainly beats having to go out and buy a, you know, several dollar bag of poly pellets. And it's, it was just the right amount. Actually, I probably could have put a little bit more in there. Um, there was a few left over, but I was afraid of overstuffing him. So that is my completed project for this time. Um, projects to come. The only thing that I probably will do in the next, uh, until I record again, is uh, every year for Into the Wool, there is a kit that we, uh, that comes in the goodie bag. I make the bag um, because I am the project bag on Etsy. Probably didn't say that, um, but maybe you inferred that already. I make bags um, and then Dana of Unwind, she dyes some type of yarn based on the fabric from that bag. And then we reach out to a designer and collaborate with them to design something based on the yarn. So. Uh, we haven't gotten, we haven't talked about our designer this year, but, uh, and we've talked briefly about what our uh, intentions are for fabrics, but I am going to be making possibly the bag. I want, I've got a pattern I've picked out, or we've collaborated about a pattern, and I need to make the pattern and be sure that I'm comfortable with making 100 of them. <laughs> um, and also, you know, that it's going to be feasible for the supplies involved and, you know, all those sorts of things. So um, it seems pretty straightforward. I've never worked this pattern before, but anyway, that is the only thing that I have in the category of projects to come is a sewing pattern or sewing project. Um, I typically don't intend to talk about um, purchases, yarn purchases, um, mainly because I don't intend on making very many. I I've gone a little overboard in the last couple of years with yarn purchases and I'm just not knitting as quickly as I would like to um, for the yarn that I already have. So I'm going to try to limit my yarn purchases for the year. So other than the yarn for um, for the sweater for my daughter-in-law, future daughter-in-law, um, I think this is the only other thing that I've purchased this entire year and we're two months in so you know. Not too bad. This was a pre-order that I did from Kirby Werby and it just so happened that it arrived today. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have even thought about talking about it. But this colorway is called If Keith Morrison Shows Up, It's Bad. So um, I must admit that I don't understand the reference at all, but this colorway spoke to me. Um, golds, reds, grays, creams. It's just really pretty. Um, so I'm excited about that. And I'll put it in my bin of self-striping um, self yarn. Socks to come, eventually. I, okay, let's see what else is on my list here. Look, I'm drinking out of my Kansas City Starbucks mug that my friend Abby brought me to Into the Wool the second year I think it was she was my roommate and she brought each of us in the cabin a mug from Kansas City because she is a Mizzou girl born and bred and of course the Kansas City Chiefs just won the Super Bowl so I'm drinking my coffee tonight out of um, 
my Kansas City mug in celebration with Abby. So, um, okay, so everything else I, ha or the only other thing I have to talk about is my fun fact from Southern Maryland and an Into the Wool update. And um, let me go ahead and do the Into the Wool update. So we, um, in case you don't know, in case you're new here, I am assistant coordinator for the Into the Wool Fiber Retreat, and that happens in September every year in Middle Tennessee. And we had signups started on February 1st at 3 p.m. Uh, I think it was within an hour and a half. We were about 80% full, I think, something like that. Um, at this very moment, I believe we have nine spots, eight or nine spots. Uh, if you're at all interested in learning about our fiber retreat, uh, fiber as in knitting, spinning, cross-stitching, tatting, weaving, um, really you don't even need to be a fiber artist. If you would like to come as a fiber artist and you have a friend that you want to bring with you just, you know, to come and hang out with a great group of people for the weekend, uh, you know, we invite that too. Uh, I know the first year we had several mother and daughter pairs that came and uh, one of, you know, each of those pairs didn't do any of those things. They just came to enjoy a weekend away, an actual retreat with their child or mother. So anyway, um, that is September the tw 17th through the 20th of this year. And if you are interested, we have a Ravelry group and that is the only place that you will find a link for signups. Um, prior to signing up, you will want to check out the information thread and the frequently asked questions and all those sorts of things. Any question you could probably have is going to be found in that that group. Um, cost is $400. Money is due in Dana's hands no later than April 30th. Fee will, uh, your fee to $400 includes lodging on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, eight meals, which is dinner on Thursday, all three meals on Friday and Saturday, and breakfast on Sunday, snacks, drinks all throughout the weekend, uh, a goodie bag, all activities, and a t-shirt. So it's pretty well all, ex all inclusive. Uh, we do have a attendee only vendor market that you are welcome to shop. Um, now that, uh, or since last podcast, I'm able to announce who our vendors are this year. We have, um, Unwind Yarn Company, Honeycomb Hills Yarn, Round Table Yarns, Arkansas Yarn Company, Spunky Sheep, Two Guys Yarn Company, Bead Sisters slash Blueberry Chick, um, that's Kay. She has bags under Bead Sisters and Blueberry Chick Yarns. Rainstorm Studios and Cottontail Farms. So um, two of those are brand new to us and the rest are returning. They've been with us before and we're excited about every one of them. There's a variety of options for your shopping um, pleasure, I guess. Uh, so, okay. And let's see, I'm at 23 minutes. I can't go too long because my phone will run out of space to be able to upload. So. Um, and before I get to the fun fact, also, um, I, this, uh, actually this past weekend, what helped me get through so much of this knitting of this sweater is the fact that I found out through, I guess my Acorn TV subscription that a new episode or a new season of Midsummer Wur Murders was on Acorn. I guess it was Acorn. Yeah. Excuse me. It had to have been, um, but it was only four episodes and I thought a season was six. So I don't know if they all haven't dropped yet or what exactly it was. But anyway, uh, each of those episodes is around hour 20 or something like that. So it was, it was a good chunk of time to work on, on this here sweater. Uh, that's a program that I really enjoy. I, I can't remember how long I've been watching it, but uh, probably I found it, I'm thinking uh, about four years ago, probably. Um, so cozy, mystery, British, you know, all the things I love in a show, a show or a book like those. That's, that's my genre of choice. Um, so yeah, really pretty much all other than that, you know, there's, there's basketball. It's, it's a great time to 
you know, be hunkered down in your house because it's cold and it's raining nonstop outside and just be taking in all the sports. Um, you know, actually, now that I'm looking at this background behind me, I realized that I didn't talk about that either. Uh, I decided this is probably going to be my background from now on. Um, this actually is a quilt top. A top only. Um, it's twin size. It's paper pieced. It's all boutiques from my favorite and local quilt shop, Material Girls Quilt Boutique in La Plata, Maryland. And... Um, it was a class that I took at Material Girls. I do not remember the year, but it's been many, many years. We've been in our house, this house, for seven years, and we were still living at our other house. So it's been more than seven years that I made this. I, my kids were still in Cub Scouts, and they are now 18 and 22. So yeah, it's been a minute. But one of these days, it will get long arm quilted. It's too pretty for me to quilt just straight line quilting like I typically do. I want to send it to a long armor and that's what's held me back is that I just don't have, I've never had the extra funds to do that. Um, I had the backing already. Um, I want to say, I think my backing is this, this dark blue. I'm pretty sure that's what I picked for it, but I think I've got like seven yards of it or something like that waiting for the day. <laughs> <coughs> Anyway, it was a class I took that was intended to be a, uh, it was a table runner class to learn how to paper piece. And I enjoyed the process and the pattern and the colors so much that I decided to take it, you know, to keep going. And I turned it into a twin size top um, with the intentions of giving it to my oldest son. So at this rate... Uh, you know, maybe it'll be for his child one day, <laughs> but in the meantime, it makes a very pretty backdrop. Um, but it's, I just, I love batiks. Um, so anyway, um, it was the split star and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the book, but I, I think I have it here. I don't think it's in storage. If I can track it down, I will put um, a link to the book uh, in the show notes, which you can find on Ravelry. Okay, so I think I've, I've covered all the bases now. Um, all right. I promised you next or last time that I was going to give you like a more interesting fun fact. This is not about an actual person. This is about a, an herb. I don't know if you'd call it an urban legend. I don't know. A folklore. Which, as I was reading this, as I came across this, it's purported to be the oldest ghost story in America. So, I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, it makes for a good story no matter. Okay. At nearby Rose Hill, which um, from where I live is, I don't know. 15 minutes probably. A legend has lived on for more than 200 years about buried gold and the spiritual pro protector of that small fortune. That Charles County's blue dog legend has been around for more than two centuries is not surprising. And then it's purported to be the oldest ghost story in America. Okay, so there seems to be some confusion as to whether the story originates from the colonial period or the time of the Civil War. Most ver versions focus on the 18th century when soldier Charles Thomas Sims and a blue tick hound stepped into one of many, the many tatter, oh my goodness, the many taverns said to inhabit the colonial town. So I'm going with, I'm sure it was colonial times and not civil war times, but later in this story, you'll see that it ties back in. So we know the date was February 8th, and that's why I thought that this was good timing too, because as of the time of this recording, it's the 5th. And most legends place the story just after the American Revolution. Sims's tongue was loosened by the libations he consumed, and he began bragging about a quantity of gold he had on his person, along with a deed to some property. Henry Hanos of Port Tobacco and his friends were listening to Sims enumerated over and over about how good his fortune had been. So when the soldier, Sims, started off from the tavern, he got as far as Rose Hill Manor in Charles County before he was confronted by Hanos and his friends who demanded his money and the deed. So they were robbing him. Sims was killed in the confrontation and his blue tick hound also was slain, valiantly trying to defend his master. 
Legend has it that both man and dog died atop a large stone at Rose Hill. Uh, Hanos took the sto his stolen loot and buried it along with the deed under a holly tree, the holly tree that grew somewhere along Rose Hill Road. When he went back later to retrieve the treasure, he was confronted by the ghost of a huge blue tick hound. Some versions of the story also claim that the dog was part mastiff. Uh, either way, though, Blue Dog is a large dog of significant size and girth and could apparently literally frighten you to death. Shortly after this, after this encounter, Hanos took sick and fell fatally ill. Reports of the Blue Dog's ghost began surfacing in the years that followed in the soldier's death. So here's where the, Amer where the American Civil War is coming in. So during the American Civil War, General Joseph Hooker, who temporarily led the Grand Army of the Potomac until a disastrous rout at Chancellorsville got him the hook, if you will, from President Abraham Lincoln, camped some 12,000 Union troops on the western shore of Charles County. Here's another fun fact coming for you that I didn't know when I chose the legend of the Blue Dog. I didn't know that this also was going to be another fun Charles County fact, but listen to this. From 1861 through March 1862, Hooker maintained his quarters at Chickamauga Methodist Church. The fascinating side note of this story is that Hooker's camps resembled brothels and members of the world's oldest profession followed the camps wherever they went. The or origin of the slang Hooker for a prostitute comes from this historical oddity. So there's another one of our ties to fame, I suppose. Some of Hooker's men heard the Blue Dog legend and decided they would find and dig up the buried treasure. When they went to abscond with the money, they allegedly found themselves confronted by the luminous specter of a huge blue tick hound who aggressively challenged them to such an extent that they gave up the ghost. I don't know who wrote this, but come on. <laughs> and to wrap it up, Olivia Floyd, the Confederate spy who lived at Rose Hill Manor during the Civil War, confessed to this Port Tobacco Times in 1897 that she had encountered the ghost of the blue dog. So when I was a child growing up here, you know, we learned about the legend of the blue dog and it's something uh, that even if you're a native here, it seems like not everybody is familiar with. So I was happy to come across a story or when I did a search that I was able to find a story that articulated, you know, what the legend exactly was. Um, but uh, supposedly on February 8th is the... Um, the time of year that you can hear the hound, the blue dog calling in the woods around that area. So um, incidentally, not far from Rose Hill Manor is the home of Thomas Stone, who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. His, um, his home site is run by the National Park Service and it's a nice visit. Um, I visited there this past December um, on the historical homes trail that they do around Christmas time. So um, I hope you enjoy that and I think that's going to be everything from me this week or this this bye week <laughs> uh, this episode. I will be back with you on February the 18th. That is the intention. I've been recording these last couple of uh, episodes on Wednesdays but I do hope to be back on a Tuesday as provided it all works out for me. Um, and until then, I wish you well, and I do thank you so much for joining me today. Bye!